and why are shareholders particularly grumpy? Here's a quote from Paul Flynn on an analyst call on the 25th of October, 2022. He says, share buybacks have been and are expected to remain an efficient and value creating way to return capital to you, our shareholders, particularly if the share price is undervaluing the company, which we believe remains the case. When he said that, Whitehaven share price was about 10 bucks. And he said, you know, the share price is undervaluing the company at 10 bucks. It's now $6.70. Right, oh, no, money mine. It's Tuesday. Got to check the date every fucking time. 19th of September. Welcome to the show. Boys, I can, as I said before, feel a bit of a bit of coal dust on my face after this interview. The boys have gone absolutely balls deep into coal. Jeez, I'm talking balls deep. Like we we got beers in an hour and a half. Bloody <laughs> no no fucking no fuck ups. No nothing. We're just sending it. All right. It's not even an interview, mate. <laughs> just the the three of us today. Yeah, I know. Right, boys. Whitehaven. Isn't it, mm. Shouldn't it be Blackhaven? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Go it's it's part of the ESG polished image, mate. You call it call, call the, the black rock white. Oh. Yeah. It's a pretty schmick looking uh, annual report as well. Did you catch that? Oh. It's very polished, you know. <laughs> got, to, got to appease the ESG guy. <laughs> <laughs> very good. We're going into uh, Cyprium's little recap and a bit of unnecessary history of the uh, nifty operation from me. I had to find something to do while you were going, um, going deep on Whitehaven. Yep. So. And they did, have <laughs> actual, they did have actual relevant news out Last night, which is why we're talking about them. Exactly. Got you down the rabbit hole to start. Yeah, exactly. I love you. He's a dog with a bone. Right, boys. Let's get into it. K-drill. K-drill. Not sure if they drill for coal. Probably could. Coal would be easier due to the fracturable nature to for Rhino Sullivan to break up with his bare hands if K-drill did start exploring for coal assets. But mostly, mostly probably WA-focused and RC drilling experts, you'd say. Wouldn't you say, Trav, you know your drillers. Yeah. Do you even need a drill for coal? Like, just poke in a hole every few hundred metres. I think you just follow mate. the fucking thing forever, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm going to do a trip over I'll, east. I'll take Ryan with me and see if he can just find <laughs> a million new discoveries. <laughs> just in case money of mine wants to go against ESG and get into coal mining and us, uh, k are probably going to be the firm to help us do it, <laughs> though they do have extreme ESG credentials if you want to get them for a RC drill. Well, I think some of these would, K-drill. would contend what you're saying, but we'll get into that later. I thought you were going to get involved then, JD. Was <laughs> <Also> I not? <laughs> before, we, before we get into the coal stuff, mate, um, I want to add a little bit of colour on a couple of the conversations that we had Yesterday, it was a pretty controversial episode yesterday. Some, uh, I didn't some, even think it was, but some it, fiery apparently topics. it was. Uh, the first first thing I want to talk about is De Grey. We hypothesised about the CapEx in the upcoming DFS, and there's been some commentary straight out of Beaver Creek on this one. Glenn Jardine, in his speech there, said we... So that's a, that's a gold presentation for those wondering. There's a big, big mm. uh, conference up there in Denver. Yep. And um, MD Glenn Jardine, in his speech there, said... We also see the payback period um, that we're showing there of under two years. We see that continuing into the DFS due to the Brogart starter pit. So um, some signaling around the CapEx, which we uh, talked about and speculated what it might get to. We'll certainly be paying attention to that one, JD, and, and uh, how they how they maintain that two-year payback will be intriguing to us when the DFS drops. The other one I want to talk about, sure, fellas. Maybe. Is um wildcat? So we it's had, actually wildcat. Wildcat. <laughs> so we had, we had Bogan geologist on our show yesterday, and um yeah, Bogan had some pretty pretty you know intriguing commentary on that one, which got a bit of punchy. attention. Punchy commentary, yeah, for sure. And I, I think I think it's worth adding um, a perspective from there's this there's this geo on Twitter who just puts out really really good content. His name is Dwayne Sparks at uh, Sparks underscore Dwayne, and he says. I've had a couple of people ask my thoughts on Wildcat's downhole drilling, in brackets, drilling into the dip of the pegmatite. So I thought I'd just give my views in a post. I don't have an issue with it as long as the company is transparent with shareholders and that shareholders are aware that the grades within this drill hole could be well under or well over the overall grade of the pegmatite. The issue with drilling into the dip direction with the pegmatites is that pegmatite are generally zoned, meaning different minerals form throughout different sections of the pegmatite. Using the below cross section, you can see spodumene typically not always forms a central zone within the pegmatite. As you can probably guess, you're drilling down dip, but there's a chance you could only drill through the ore zone if you drill through the spodumene zones. The grade will be well higher 
then if you smeared it across the entire pegmatite body, your grade will be very elevated within this zone. The good thing about this type of drilling is that it can provide you with the initial depth of the pegmatite using a single hole. Hope this helps. Cheers. Mm. Yeah, it did. I liked what he said on no, because that affirms what Bogan was saying about the irregular nuggety effect of the lithium, but I guess drilling through it does uh, confirm some form of continuity and depth. But um, as I said, well above or well below, depending on which little skin. It looks like one of those cells you're seeing in your science classes back in year eight if you're on the YouTube. Great picture. Thanks, Dwayne. And I think Dwayne's tweet's a really high density value. Um, He's posting geology fundamentals in a pretty easy to understand way for the masses. We love his work. And let's get him on the show, guys. Mate, you can't put that shit up on Twitter. Do I expect to not have to come onto the show to do all our GI shit for us? Can can everyone message Dwayne on Twitter and tell him to come on? I keep asking him, but he um, hasn't said yes yet, but one of these days he will. Someone send us his phone (laughs) number for a box of piss. (laughs) Righto, boys. Whitehaven Carl. Get into it. I'm not even going to intro it because you've done <laughs> fucking hours of work on this. So this is going to be this is going to be good. I yep. will sacrifice a beer for this. Yeah. Well, we should crack a beer and have one while we talk about. Yeah, this we've got a beer fridge now. It's worth it. We have to donate a carton. <laughs> Doing a deep dive, Maddie, and there's a lot happening with this stock, and we won't be able to do it justice in this segment. But and I've been wanting to talk about it for a while. And the reason we're finally going to talk about it now, let's talk about the confluence of factors all coming together. There's a billion dollar M&A deal, well, a multi-billion dollar M&A deal that's um, on the cards. There's some shareholder activism. There are continuous disclosure concerns um, and there are corporate governance question marks. This is a money of mine story. <laughs> it's through got your and through. fucking name written all over it, you two. <laughs> Big Love it. So why it's in the news, Maddie, is you, you would have seen the sales process of Dornier and Blackwater, the mm-hmm. assets held 50-50 in a, in a JV between BHB and Mitsubishi, so known as BMA. Fun fact, I had a scholarship with BMA at uni for in when I was doing mining engineering. Eight and a half grand a year they gave me, and I never went and worked for them. Wow. I pretty much spent it on schooners, pokies, and mm. other things you could buy for 25 bucks a pop. <laughs> but, um, yeah, anyway, fun facts with Matt. There you go. Yeah. go. Oh, thanks, BHB. So I have something to contribute. Cheers, BMA. <laughs> Sorry I didn't work for you. So a quick bit of background on the on the financial position as it's relevant for Whitehaven. They closed the, the year with $2.65 billion in cash. They've got an $800 million tax bill that's due to be paid in December and they've paused the share buyback. So there's an initial period where they had to pause it with the annual report upcoming, a blackout period. And they've paused it again pending the sales process that we're going to get into regarding Dornier and Blackwater. These are big assets too, right? I mean, yeah, Blackwater and Dornier, it's like 24 and 17 years reserve life respectively, but I yeah. mean, these things keep going. Exactly. That's that's just reserves. That's not even taking into account the resource to reserve. And that's a fucking conversion. huge, that's a big fucking mine. Like oh, coal open pits are huge. Yeah. Yeah. Different scale to our little pesky little undergrounds we talk about. Remarkable. Like, like genuinely, yeah, insane scale. All right, so let's get into the activist shareholder. So there's this group out of uh, England, I assume London, called Bell Rock Capital Management. There are um, a fund that has accumulated a bit less than 5% of the issued stock of Whitehaven. And they've been pretty vocal, Maddie, about their dissatisfaction around management's disclosure of their capital management strategy. So they are fervently against Whitehaven buying these two assets. And they even uh, engaged a research house to do a poll of what Whitehaven shareholders think of all of this. And I, I like this form of, form of um, I like learning about all the different ways that activist shareholders engage in the activism. For us, it's just it's yelling to a right? microphone, but for so, some people it's polling the shareholders. <laughs> so, so we're Bell Rock just very content sitting there with buybacks and massive dividends during this great period for coal. And that, they don't that's right. So the, the outcome, Matty, of, of that, uh, uh, poll that they did, the, the various polls that they did, was an overwhelming number of respondents agreed that increased shareholder returns through the payment of dividends should be a priority, to your point yep. there, Maddie, and that a clear majority of larger shareholders disagreed that the company should increase borrowing to invest in new mines. Yeah, right. So how many share, are they representing all the shareholders or they're using their no, that percent, five percent mm. shareholding as the voice. Well they've yeah. supposedly engaged this research house which has gone and reached out to other yeah. Whitehaven shareholders. We don't know what number of shareholders responded to, yeah. to this poll. Or how the question is structured and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But yeah. I mean to, to speak to your point, Maddie, on capital allocation, like, you know, were they just keen for buybacks and all that sort of stuff? Like that's the that's the 
the point to sort of get into around the activism, right? Because one of the major critiques from shareholders relates to the suspension of these share buybacks by the company. Um, re- remember, buybacks are a way for like the company to return capital to shareholders. They, they paused their buybacks, Whitehaven, they paused it in August with their uh, MD and CEO, Paul Flynn, stating that they would halt this, in quotation marks, while Whitehaven considers application of Whitehaven's capital allocation framework in light of growth opportunities. Growth opportunities. Yeah, oh, right. we're going to link it. We're going to link it all together. Um, so I think for, for money miners that don't know, a buyback is when the company buys back the shares and takes them off the register. So yep. the value per yep. share goes up because there's less shares. Yeah, the earnings yep. per share and so on go up. There's two main ways to return capital to shareholders, that is issuing a dividend and buying back. Yeah. So when when they paused these buybacks, the share price fell off about 17% over the week subsequent to that announcement. A lot of shareholders remain concerned that capital will get allocated to bad M&A rather than distributed back to shareholders in the form of buybacks and dividends. And why are shareholders particularly grumpy? Here's a quote from Paul Flynn on an analyst call on the 25th of October, 2022. He says, Share buybacks have been and are expected to remain an efficient and value-creating way to return capital to you, our shareholders, particularly if the share price is undervaluing the company, which we believe remains the case. When he said that, Whitehaven share price was about 10 bucks. And he said, you know, the share price is undervaluing the company at 10 bucks. It's now $6.70. And JD and Maddie, I'm not sure why you say it's undervalued at 10 bucks, but seemingly not so at $6.70. Oh, there's, <laughs> there's some fascinating details in and around that trading at those various price points, which we're going to get into more later. So is that is this this company saying, the the activists saying, do they do they not like the Blackwater and Daudia deals? Well, they think it's, they don't, they don't want to go into any M&A or is it specifically these two? It's risk. Like the big thesis that's exciting to you as an owner of Whitehaven is the fact that they've got these assets, they're producing lots of cash and they're going to um, deliver returns to shareholders by way of a buyback. A big M&A deal is just risk that the yeah. capital that you have you know, rightfully accrued from these you know, great times, blah, 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 is just going to go to something that might not work out. We're not saying that we won't get it on agreed terms and we'll get into what we think about that later on, but it's just risk as a shareholder. You sort of you prefer the certainty that um, the capital gets back to you rather than risk the downside of, of, of M&A, especially when it's in the multi-billion dollar price tag, which which we're talking about. So, right, but, what about the, I guess, the disclosure, the poor shareholder communication you mentioned? What's going on there? Yeah, so the, the wording that they, they like to use is selective disclosure in and around this. So Tell you only the good shit. Pardon? Tell you just the good shit. <laughs> no, <laughs> select no, no, who to tell no. the good oh, shit to. Who to tell. <laughs> so what has been accused, uh, what they've alleged the company has done is after the annual meeting, which we actually spoke about, Maddie, a couple uh, months ago now, there was an investor meeting for select a select group of investors in Singapore where they were told information that not all shareholders and investors broadly were told. So, you know, uneven distribution of the same information. So they were asked the question, on in the analyst call at the end, are you interested in buying Dornia and Blackwater? And I think what I said at the time is that they just played it straight back. They said, um, we look at everything and Dornia is proximate to one of our growth assets in Winchester South. So they didn't confirm that they were interested in these assets. So then it came out over over the weekend that these guys, Bell Rock, had written a letter to the company asking for clarification and perhaps confirmation on whether they were in fact interested in picking up these assets. And hence we come out to the to the point yesterday with Whitehaven coming out with the announcement that's saying they are in fact in the bidding process for these two assets. Yeah, right. And this that's- is the in- intriguing part is because there was this allegation that some investors knew that beforehand. The stock had been trading really strangely and I think that's kind of the uncertainty part of it has been – what's created a little bit of disgruntled shareholder dynamics because um, you've seen the stock have really weird intraday trading as a result of uncertainty about how they might fund a potential acquisition. So is that the, the drop from 10 bucks to $6.70 where it is today, has that been a lot of that fueled by this uh, the, M&A specul- speculation? But, uh, both Thermo and Metcall prices have come off substantially over, over the last year as well, so yep. not purely attributable. And... On the, on the last bit on the announcement that they came out with yesterday, it's, it was only sort of four odd lines 
and you know quite prominently the last line is that the company will continue to abide by its continuous disclosure um, obligation. Yeah, right. Okay, so how's Chuck Whitehaven in the mix of going to take over these big massive BHP assets? Are they operational ready? I think we've uh, – see you've written here, history of production misses. Well, I think this is – the history of production misses is actually relating to Whitehaven themselves as a company. Um, like when you talk to Whitehaven shareholders, they're really quick to point out that Whitehaven has a tendency to downgrade and miss guidance consistently um, in a way that you rarely ever see for similar sized miners. It's, it's, it's like something to behold. Uh, Mondi on Twitter, who's a great Mintwit analyst at Mondi Invest on Twitter, he tweeted about this back in April and he charted up the downgrades and guidance misses on annual production guidance since FY19 for Whitehaven. It's pretty compelling when you look at it, right? Um, the tweet here says, a quick look at past guidance attempts from Whitehaven using the top end of range given each time. FY21 had four downgrades, FY23 on track to be the lowest in five years even at the top end of current range. So that's one downgrade a quarter in FY21. <laughs> yeah, and I mean he's talking about the and guidance for the full full year guidance. Um, and they only just got it. And yeah, yeah I mean, like, con- yeah, so his last point there is constantly bullish and constantly missing, hashtag cold Twitter. And they've had three already. Well, this this was, keep was an, April, an April tweet, so it's a bit dated, but yeah. Yeah, wow. All right, why don't we get into the alignment of the board? We'll, we'll chat about a couple – Directors. So first up, Raymond Zage is a non-executive director. So he's a bit of an interesting character. He's founded a company called Tiger Investments. He'd previously started the Asian business of the hedge fund Farallon Capital. So they're a huge, huge US, I think the headquarters in San Francisco, huge hedge fund. And he's also ex-Goldman Sachs prior to that. He's, he's a bit maligned by Whitehaven investors because Farallon sold $300 million of Whitehaven stock or about 95 million shares in November 2019. Now, Farallon's sale is disclosed in an ASX announcement. It's a Form 605, which was lodged on the 15th of November 2019, showing an agreement to sell, which was dated the 11th of November 2019. So then on the 18th of November, Raymond Zage lodges an Appendix 3Y showing that he, in his personal name um, as a director, has acquired 9.2 million shares between the 11th of November and the 15th of November. Now, note that this disclosure says he did not hold any securities prior to the 3Y. On the 5th of December, so just a few short weeks later, Whitehaven provide a guidance downgrade. These guidance downgrades weren't uncommon, as we have talked about earlier. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, just to round out on Zage, he still owns, as of now, he uh, owns about 11 million, a bit over 11 million shares. So he's got a substantial personal holding. Okay, so he was the founder. His fund sold a shitload of shares and then he bought some back personally. Yeah, at about the pre- same pre- time. Yeah, a fund he'd previously worked for but was still an advisor yeah. to. Okay, yep. Yeah. 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 Right, yeah. next. Paul Flynn, Paul CEO Flynn. and MD. <laughs> I think Paul is um, perhaps even more maligned than Raymond amongst some of the noisy Whitehaven uh, shareholders out there, fellas. And they are pretty noisy. They are pretty noisy. <laughs> <laughs> the critique- is malo- is, dumb question, yeah. maligned. Yeah, yeah. Is that misaligned? No. Not aligned? No. What's not, maligned? Not loved. Mind? Yeah, not loved. Not loved. Yeah. Um, Jeez, I learned a lot around you, <laughs> boys. Cheers for that. Continue no on. No worries. So, Paul, um, I think the critiques from Whitehaven shareholders about Paul, they they kind of actually do sort of – they're related to minimal alignment and selling of Whitehaven stock um, personally as over the journey. Why, why don't we go through, you know, the, the last five or six years of how – you know, you look at his compensation and then his sell downs of the yeah. stock. The vast majority of the stock that Paul has owned over the journey has, um, you know, come about by way of um, of, of his remuneration package and performance uh, metrics and all that sort of stuff. And he's regularly, yeah, sold them th- those shares down in in sizable packages over the journey. Starting like, I mean, we can just go back over the last five or so years. In September 2018, he sold. 32% of his then position for $3.3 million. June 2020, he sold 43% of his then position for $1.8 million. 
in March 2021, he sold 38% of his then um, position for $1.8 million. And less than three weeks later, there was a production guidance downgrade. In November 2022, he sold 46% of his then position for $7.8 million, less than a month after his quote about there being value for Whitehaven to buy its own stock back at the $10 share price, which is what we touched on earlier. There's some big fucking chunks of your stock sell, mm. like of ownership selling in yep. one go, isn't it? Yeah, and, and today he he holds slightly over a million shares, which is uh, the lowest number of shares held by Paul since 2017. So let's tie in why this all matters. Let's get into the remuneration dissatisfaction amongst shareholders. So in 2021, 53% of shareholders voted against the company's remuneration Report so you you pretty rarely see this. That's a that's one strike against them. There's a sort of mechanism where they ha- have to get you know a certain amount voting for it in the next financial year, which they ended up getting. But on this 2021 vote, the reasons the key concerns that were flagged by shareholders were misalignment between guidance and short term incentive gateways from a production and a cost perspective, a lack of minimum shareholding requirement. Third point was. Uh, perception that the management was not held to account for some environmental incidents, also that there were too many incidents occurred for their stretch outcomes to be awarded, limited short-term incentive target disclosures, and we might get into that later. It's very opaque to work out what the actual pay is incentivized around. The sixth point was high CEO pay relative to their market ta- cap and competitors, and there was another point as well. Mm. So, some of those points have since been addressed in the subsequent remuneration report. Ports, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that a bit further down. Yeah, right. Tell us about Dornier and Blackwater then. Mm. Why don't the we actual start with assets? Yeah, why don't we start with how you know the market and how various commentators are valuing them? So, mm. sort of a good point to start, I think. So we've we've sort of drawn data from a few different people, commentators and whatnot out there. UBS, Respeculator from from Twitter and Koala as well, the Australian, the AFR, they've all had a stab at valuing these things. <laughs> Respeculator, so, you just put in the same uh, category as UBS, mate. He'd be fucking flattered. Yeah, about I that. mean to be honest, I'd, I'd rank him there. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. I would. Stuff, mate. You so know who I'd rank on the other side? I won't say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know exactly what you're getting at. <laughs> the AFR to start with, they said that BHB put a US three point five billion dollar price tag. Now that's for both the assets. Yeah, and I think we saw some pretty silly uh, headlines out of out of um, the Australian on this one. With numbers as high as US six billion. I think those numbers you see floating out there they're converging lower and lower. Um, you know, UBS I think might have been the the first uh, sell side house to actually individually value the two assets and write a specific note in relation to what they could be worth. And um, they come up with US three point three billion for the two combined. The distribution. Yeah, Blackwater for 2.5 and Dornier at 800 million. And they both have to go together? Yeah, we're going to get into that later, mm. but BHB are trying to sell them in a sort of two for one. They want to get yeah. rid of the two of them together. We assume so. That's what that's what we've heard. Um, but yeah. So the, the Koala, another sort of Twitter um, and Substack writer, came up, laid out a bunch of assumptions on a, on a lengthy Substack post, which was kind of interesting. Some of the key assumptions were using a two-time EBITDA multiple, which is relatively comparable to what the companies trade at, and a $200 long-term Metcol price. And his result was US $2.4 billion, which is uh, you know, a step lower than the other ones we've commented. And, yeah, we speculated sort of um – yeah, thumb, thumb suck number pens about the US $3 billion in, in his mouth. You're seeing the numbers sort of converge towards that $3 billion three. mark and yeah. maybe a bit bit below three. Um, yeah. I w- wouldn't be surprised to see it sort of yeah, converge around that, to, you know, 2.5 to $3 billion mark. What's cold to – because remember it was it was up at bloody 500 bucks a tonne a year or so ago. What's a bit over a year ago. What are you – now off the top of your head? Um, last time we spoke about it, it was in the 150 to 200 sort of range. Yeah. Obviously, you've got various different benchmarks. These guys get a, a get a premium to the Newcastle Thermal Coal Index. Like I think they got a over the FY twenty three got a ten percent premium. Yeah, because of the Met coal, the coking coal. Because of the quality, supposedly, of their yeah. their coal. Um, yeah, that nuke is what the the their Whitehaven's current assets are tied to. But Dornier and Blackwater have a different index. They they sure yeah. do, and that's part of the allure to. 
potentially buy into assets that are met coal as opposed to thermal coal projects and completely change the mm. complexion of their asset portfolio. That's a big draw. Which are for them. But it wasn't all the money going in and met coal well, around Hunter Valley because it was more premium uh, for using it as thermal coal. Oh, there was a period well. in time where, yeah, the dislocations in prices were a bit funny. You saw um, thermal coal trade even higher than um, met coal at one point, which created an incentive for met coal to go to thermal use yeah. cases for a while. But that was when energy was going crazy around Russia, Ukraine. But I think the point that a lot of Whitehaven shareholders are nervous about when it comes to a big M&A deal like this and using capital that they thought was going to come back to them for this is they're worried about how it's going to be financed. Like if they pay too too much, we talked about what valuation might be. If they pay too much, how are they going to fund it? Are they going to, are they going to have to do an equity raise to fund it? Is it all going to come out of the cash reserves? Are they going to um, – you know, need a debt facility which might have some terms which aren't favourable to shareholders. So all of that's on the mind of existing shareholders when they think about the risk in owning the stock at the moment. So we'll start with cash and looking at how they could potentially finance a transaction. So we touched on them having 2.65 billion Aussie dollars. Remember the prices we quoted were US in cash. They've got 800 million to be paid in tax in December. That number was of June 30, so you can imagine that they'd made a few hundred million dollars in free cash since that that time. And then, um, I mean, if they, you know, if if the acquisition price is such that there's um, requires some debt finance or they they look at that debt, then, um, yeah, I mean, you can factor that into it. It'd be curious to know what the debt pricing could ultimately be. I think we can can look around to see what, um, what other, you know, debt, for coal companies has been priced out recently. So Stanmore recently got rates in the vicinity of about 12% interest rate on its US $625 million debt facility to acquire 80% of BMC. And intriguingly, one of the lenders of that facility is Farallon Capital. Oh. Relates back to Raymond's age. Yeah, there you go. Plot thickens, man. Oh, God. (laughs) I think it's worth touching on vendor finance financing. This is – a method that some analysts had put forward. So this would simply be where, um, in you know, in a simple example where the person you're buying an asset off would help finance the purchase for you in in a style of loan, i.e. in this case BHB or perhaps yeah. the the JV loaning the the capital to the acquirer. Do you say that often? Vendor finance. Mm. You you like oh, it probably happens at a small end of town a, a bit, um, but. Like it, it can also happen, yeah, in instances where the the companies who are trying to bid for an asset don't have funding capability, but the seller can sort of wear that for a while and yep. you and wants it. to sell, you know. Yeah, like. yeah, exactly. And another another you know important element too is just like um, can strategic partners actually contribute to the financing in some sort of way. Um, it's, it's not that dissimilar to what we've seen in the lithium space, actually, with offtake partners. So in this case, you might have the likes of a steel mill, you know, yep. people that want to lock in supply. And similar to the offtake partners like automakers for, for lithium, they're worried about a supply shortage. They want to lock it in. In this case, the steel mills have probably noticed that not that many met coal projects have been, you know, coming online recently. And there's a bit of a like a dearth going forward of these assets coming online. So they want to lock in supply that, so that they can continue to, to make their product. So they might be interested in being a strategic partner or also putting up some financing. So that could be, you know, taking 25% of the, the asset itself or alternatively helping finance it. Because met coal is a bit different to thermal coal in terms of the whole ESG thing, is it? Because it thermal, the whole is. thermal coal thing is based on not using coal-fired power station, but we're still going to need steel. Yeah, so and, you, still and there are a lot of coal. there are a lot of renewable energy uh, aspects that will need steel. You know, you'll need coking coal to make steel. So these assets by these companies, they're still backing them to have long lives. You know, around that reserve life because it's going to be needed for the energy transition as well, which is a, a point that's probably um, you know confused in the media. Yeah, mm. and I mean. It, it, we talked about the UBS note. They um, they actually model that customer, like the strategic partner sort of finance for, you know, they, they call it a customer and bracket steel mill sort of or trading house coming in for 25% and paying 50 to 70% of their portion with cash. The remainder with debt is sort of how they model the funding mix of, of their scenario. It's fascinating given the, the buybacks they've done 
yeah. recently and how long these things have been on the chopping block to be sold for. So, Right. So why? what about BHP as the, as the seller? What's so, in it for them? It's not going to bloody be a piss in the ocean for them. But. So there's obviously the, the ESG reasons and their institutional investors wanting them to push away from all coal-related products. Or at least the mix away, yeah, to yep. more future-facing and exactly. less old world. You've also yeah. got them being very upset with the Queensland government at the royalties that got scaled up um, last year. That's another another reason. They're not investing in any greenfields um, projects in Queensland, so they're quite upset with the government there. This is another way of reflecting that. And you just have to say that they're probably a little less sensitive to price. BHB being BHB, they are quite tuned in to who the actual buyer is and making sure that the asset goes into the hands of a responsible buyer at yeah. the end of the day. When you're talking about um, assets that have substantial rehab liabilities, it's really important that you sell them to a party who has you know, history of actually um, embarking on rehab in the right way and can fund it in the right way and all that sort of stuff. It matters a lot, especially in the context of, you know, BHP sort of saving it's, it's, it's a brand thing, is yep. it long term? Yeah. If it goes to shit and they sold it to them, they're – Three billion bucks yeah. is, you know, a bit less than a percent of their their market cap. Yeah. If the the perception of them as a owner of a business were to change, a one percent change would be, and their their share price would be much more influential, you know, over the long, long term. If that were to substantially change, yeah. they're pretty detrimental. Uh, I think we should um have a bit of a conversation about the M and A overhang and the M and A fears that are out there in the market amongst Whitehaven shareholders clearly sort of I think we've got to ask the question do we think the M&A fears are overblown and and when you compare the performance of Whitehaven versus New Hope over the last month you see pretty divergent um divergent kind of performance which is kind of surprising you'd expect them to actually move to get together in a lot of ways and I think the the overhang is actually largely in relation to the the M&A fears that are that are out there yeah, I think you're you're right, man. And one of the uh, the concerns that um, Bellrock had raised in their in their activism was that the buyback would be ended for for good, and you know that's really upset them. Probably along with a number of other other shareholders in the stock right now. So, uh, Whitehaven, I think we mentioned it before. Are they using this as a bit of a a mix or a pivot to Met Coal or trying to mix the thermal and the Met or what, well, Trav, what's your, what's your view on, I guess, I suppose you've got to separate the ESG versus the investment case. Well, I, th I think it's like, I think it's a talking point. Like why are they so keen to like go into Met Coal? I don't actually personally think the supply demand dynamics for, um, for Met Coal are as, you know, compelling as they are thermal. Um, so I, I think that's part of the uncertainty and overhang and everything like that. Um, I find it a bit odd that Whitehaven is so publicly keen to get more Met coal in the mix because, um, like, like obviously there's the peak China narrative and that's bad for Met coal, but there's also um, like less exposure to the energy price squeeze thesis if you go hard on Met coal and less mix on thermal coal. Um, I suppose a counter to that would be that, you know, this company is very close to coal, far closer than, than we are, and they perhaps, you know, that, maybe. that would be the dynamic or that would be the argument that they would make yeah. in them, yeah. you know, perhaps it's like India growth or something like that or emerging market. but Yeah, and I mean, Met Coal is debt financeable and I don't think Thermal Coal is debt financeable anymore. I don't yeah. think it is at all. <laughs> right. So they, they've, they've said that on the analyst yeah. call. They, they've said banks would be willing to finance MET but not Thermal Coal projects. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's say Whitehaven buy uh, these two assets for $3 billion, hypothetically. Going to be a good deal or not? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll have to uh, reserve our um, – it depends how they finance it, right? Because mm. if you – What do you say, the finance word? Will it be accretive? Accretive, yeah. And, I mean, like the big fear in the market is that if Whitehaven – are successful, it won't be a good deal. And it's a valid fear. I think there are some dynamics of the sale process that lend itself to the counter argument in that position though. And those are that there's like a limited pool of bidders left. Yankel's reported to be out. There's rumours Peabody's out too. Um, you know, BHP are getting out. <laughs> <laughs> every, every, the big ones are getting yeah. out. Yeah. So there are other rumours floating about that, you know, Whitehaven were one of, if not the only party to actually put a bid on both assets um, and BHP, you know, they likely want that simplicity of selling both at the same time to the same party. Um, but, you know, buying from 
BHP, like there's another element too, and that's that buying these assets from BHP, they're a forced seller in some ways because they got pressure on them from investors to have a higher mix of um, future-facing commodities instead. Uh, and, you know, there's mine life beyond the reserve life. Whitehaven Coal, they probably have a, a much higher long-term price on Met Coal too. And like these kind of circumstances, this confluence of circumstances is usually the confluence of circumstances that lead to getting a deal done on attractive terms because, you know... Okay. So then, okay, bring the management in. You went through the management and the historical um, selling of shares. Mm. We've got the companies, I guess, how they're looking at the future for coal. What do you think, I guess, the management's incentives are yeah, on these? Yeah, that's, because that's the other thing too is like how do you know they're going to do it on attractive terms? What if what if the incentives are to get a deal done at, at any price because incentives aren't properly aligned? And what's the quote we always say, JD? Show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcome. Exactly right. So a specific example, Maddie, would be if one of the incentives for management is to just simply grow production then it'd be very easy for them to go and do an acquisition at any price and yeah. get it done. Not saying that's specific here, although yeah. their management's incentives at, in Whitehaven's case are hmm. confusing to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> so Jaddy and I, we, we looked at the remuneration report in the FY23 annual report to, to try and make sense of um, what sort of KPIs there are for management. Safe to say we were left with more questions than answers after reading it. A big portion of well, that. Lucky I didn't fucking try. <laughs> Uh, a big portion of that exact remuneration appears to be linked to an SIP structure. 80% of the SIP outcome relates to KPIs on a scorecard. Now, you look at this scorecard, 25% on the scorecard relates to EBITDA, 20% to ROM production, 15% to FOB cost per tonne. There's some other stuff there, but those are the three I want to talk about. It's very ambiguous to say the least. What, what is it specifically about EBITDA that is the goal? What is it specifically about production or costs that are the goals? We, we don't know. Yeah, what? How many it's tons a, have you got to get? Yeah, what is at, the ROM production? Yeah, and it's the, at the board's discretion, really. The question I have, and maybe there's some remuneration experts out there that can clarify, I'm not making accusations that these are incentives are poorly aligned. I actually don't understand them well enough, Maddie. Um, but like the question, open ended question I have is like, are these KPIs achieved? Can they just achieve the KPIs by acquiring other assets? <laughs> so <laughs> like, is, is it a combined ROM production? Yeah, like or is it you individual? know, if, yeah. if it's just a, a, a flat EBITDA target, then EBITDA growth you know isn't accretive for shareholders if you end up diluting shareholders to smithereens to get there. And same with ROM production, and then you've got the FOB cost per ton. Like that's an, another metric which. Um, like imagine a scenario if you acquired assets that had a lower cost basis, do you just, instead of actually lowering cost at your existing assets, do you just have on a group level lower cost? Those are the questions I'd love to have clarified as it relates to, uh, yeah. And there's, there's another element yeah. as well, Trav. The, um, the performance rights, they're tied to, in quotes, strategic priority delivery measure. Yeah, this is a, 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 another part of that REM package there. I, I read this part here, JD, and I thought, I mean, there's a quote that stands right out from going through it, right? Yeah. New initiatives that add to long-term coal reserves and enhancing resource security. So sounds like M and A is part of part of that one. <laughs> it sure does. But like we said, quite ambiguous. So we wouldn't mind getting that cleared up. <laughs> yeah. the The big point is M um, and A for the sake of M and A is bad. It's important to make sure incentives are aligned to actually creating shareholder value, and you've got to make sure these metrics are tied to things like, you know. Demon, demonstrating you know, improvement on a per share basis for metrics and also like that can be hacked if you just add debt into the system on a per share. You've got you to risk adjust and all that. There's a whole bunch of stuff. I'd love to do a podcast with a remuneration expert on what incentives should actually exist out there. Hopefully they think when they do those remuneration packages, <laughs> like, fuck, we don't want these money of mine pricks to be on. Like, we've got to, if we can influence how these things are done out of fear... He's job done. <laughs> Pretty proud of that, Manny. <laughs> right. What do you say? After all that, well, let, let's se- fucking sensational. What do you think of Whitehaven Carl? All right, why don't we why don't we talk about how the how the stock trades, right? The the valuation. So I mean, quite intriguing that the company trades at one times book value. That sort of mm. stands out. I mean, the, the multiples of coal businesses in general stand out. And if you look on an EBITDA multiple basis, you're you're talking about two point three times FY24. So it's what, even, considering the gold that trades at six and oh, up to like yeah, gold six year, to nine. About, I'd call it four to five for the mid tiers. But We yeah, talked about some high quality high gold quality companies. ones are at bloody nine, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, I think Capricorn <laughs> last time we looked were eight-ish. Yeah. 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 I, 
Um, like that 2.3 times, it's somewhat, it's even somewhat comparable to Yan Cole now, which is a, like an amazing thing to think about because Yan Cole's always had a huge multiple discount for its Chinese majority ownership. I think, you know, when you talk about what do we think of Whitehaven Cole, let's talk about the context of the, the New South Wales um, royalty regime that was recently introduced. When that came out, the news that that came out, all the New South Wales coal stocks actually went up because the market was pricing in a royalty that was going to be higher than was actually yeah. announced. They were pricing in something a bit more similar to what Queensland had done probably a year or so prior. So, And, of course, Queensland would be relevant given that, that that's where these assets sit. Mm. And then you've got... Um, growth projects. Yeah, I mean, so Whitehaven, they've got some growth projects. They've had some challenges um, in in situations relating to permitting. Winchester South, we talked about it. it um, you know, The proximity to Dornia. Proximity to Dornia and infrastructure. So you've got Vickery like, as well. Makes sense for that. There's Vickery they talk about for a long time. The, com- um, the company said that they don't want to develop these assets concurrently, which is which is kind of interesting. But I think the question you should ask yourself with these growth, growth assets that haven't been recently discovered is why have they not yet been developed? So, mm-hmm. you know, what we sort of hear is that there's challenging geology, permitting, not so simple. You've got farmland and uh, a nearby creek and all these sorts of things. So it sort of lends itself to potentially buying an asset being ch- see, uh, being more straightforward than building. But this M&A overhang, like we talked about the trading valuation, that's really low multiples. And, you know, there's definitely a portion of the market who's fearful of of bad M&A in quotation marks. And I think that, you know, the overhang could be an opportunity for the people who took a contrarian view and they had a, had a different view um, because they sort of saw the potential deal to, you know, might actually just be accretive and they take a better view on coal and all that sort of stuff. So I've got, I got a couple more things I want to mention. Firstly, there is potential that some of the bidders that went in only bid for one asset, likely being Dornier rather than bidding for two of them. So wouldn't um, discredit the the thesis that only one gets sold and the other asset gets parked by BHB, similar to um, an asset that they have, Mount Arthur in um, New South Wales, that they previously tried to sell. And my last point, as we're talking about activists, Bell Rock, there is no better channel to get your message out there. <laughs> Come on, say your, your thesis. You know, Whitehaven are going to hear it. You know they're going to hear it. So come on the show and get your, get your picture across of what you really think about the situation and what you want to get across to shareholders and management alike. I, yeah. re- I reckon if you combine my feelings towards Ryan O'Sullivan, Seamus, <laughs> Langer's Bondi, that's how Trav would feel towards... Shareholder activism. Bell Rock. <laughs> a shareholder activism. <laughs> like the, a, a Bell Rock, probably the owner, the main man of Bell Rock, Trav would be, just have his tongue down his throat, I reckon. Come on the He's potty. your type of guy, Trav. I'd also invite Paul on the potty. So Paul and, and Bell Rock would be pretty cool. It's one here, yeah. one right there. We're only a phone call away. <laughs> I'll, I'll run the cameras for you. All righty. Uh, well done, guys. Good on you, boys. Bloody uh, sensational. I look forward to re-listening to that to divulge, uh, to bloody take it all in. Right. Mm. We better finish off with uh, Cyprian. They were in the, the Cyprian, the the nifty restart. All right, let's let's fly into it. So they yeah. completed a capital raising that we spoke about earlier, Maddie. We spoke about it two or three months ago. These guys have been in trading halt since February. So mm. a long-awaited return, which we might actually see soon. So Yeah, and so for money miners, this is the nifty copper mine up in the great sandy desert. It sure right is. Near, near Telfer. It's had a colourful history, which I'll go in, into a bit later. JD, what's, uh, what's going on here? The placement has finally got over the line, some interesting uh, capital structure. That's it. So yeah. to, f- to fly through it, mate, they raised $24 million in a placement. They took $5 million in an entitlement offer. They had to discount this by over 60% to get it away. Plus there was a one for two attaching option exercisable at six cents. So that to, you know, to say the least, strongly, strongly incentivized shareholders to take part in this one. Okay, so as you said, they've last traded at eleven cents. They got a four cent raise. They got the one for two attaching option at six cents. Yeah. What's What's the draw card with these one for two attaching options for the, I guess the brokers doing the deal, and then we'll talk about the implications towards the actual shareholders. I what's mean, the? How does this get it over the line? The, there's a couple of different aspects, Maddie. The The main reason though is the attraction that they can relay to their clients. You know that you can potentially, you know, you can buy into this. It's heavily discounted. 
recapitalizing the business. You got this attaching option, and I think one of the the aspects you might be alluding to is that you got that sort of free free ride. You know that option at six cents. I mean, if we get into the capital structure, which we will in a minute, gives people a bit of cover if they want to you know cash in the the shares that they have purchased at four cents. They've got that option to just hold on and see. You know, if the company gets this up and running, gets away with it, I've got that. I've got a, so a free bet. Yeah, right. So you can you can just chuck the money in for the sake of it, sell it straight away, and then you've just got a free option. Yeah. So the company ultimately just has to focus on on their job, on turning Nifty around, yeah. getting the getting the job done, because there's no two ways about it. The share price is going to come off so massively. There's potentially a lot of selling pressure at that. If it retraces, opens at that four cent level after the raise, there's potentially a lot of pressure there if the people are using that trade that strategy yeah i'd anticipate there's going to be a huge amount of volume when the um when the stock opens again so the capital structure right now is pretty wild you've got 1.5 billion shares on issue 420 million unquoted oppies like we said exercisable at six cents 80 million warrants exercisable at 4.8 cents 115 million performance rights 100 million in convertible notes it's paying four percent per Per annum. Per annum. Yeah. Like it's just, it's not pretty, right? It's yeah, because those convertible notes are from when they purchased it off Metals X, I think. It was nine million bucks there was There was another convertible note that was done just a quarter ago for oh, yeah. $21 million. So yeah, right. So, okay, been in, they've, and they've requested to have the voluntary suspension now lifted. Yeah, they still need to meet a few the- ASX, uh, you know, listing criteria to, to be listed again, but hopefully for shareholders that's happening soon. Yeah, right. I mean, essentially it's, you know, bad luck for past shareholders, recapitalize the business and give it another go now. Yeah, right. So it's a, it's a copper bet. It sure is. It's a, it's an asset that sits high up on the cost curve. So you're really betting on like a, like quite a few other actual copper assets in Australia on that copper price going upward from here. That's high up on the cost curve from their 2022 cost numbers as well. So I'll we'll go into them. That's None right. Them later. So, Maddie, give us the history. Oh, the history. So the you see, there's a, there's been a bit of board restructuring, and one of the guys coming back on is Milan Yekovic. He's coming on as the chief operating officer. So, oh, it, it it rung a bit of a bell. So, oh, I know, I know this guy. Yeah. Well, so look, Nifty. I'll give you the history of Nifty. So that was it was discovered in '81 by Western Mining. They mined it from '93. <coughs> <clears throat> Pardon me, Nifty. It, they it was purchased then by Straits Resources in 1998 for 53 million bucks. They spent around 20 million bucks on it, expanding it to the current capacity of like the leaching capacity they got now, 27 and a half thousand ton per annum. And then they sold it to Aditya Birla in 2003 for 159 million. But that 69 of that went straight out the door to pay for debt and repayments, and. Metals X then took it over from Aditya Birla in 2016. So they, but Milan Yurkovic was the long serving CEO of Straits. So to round that one out, then it went to Cyprium when they, when yeah. Metals X got rid of it in Metals, 2020, right? Yeah, it sold yep. it to Cyprium. We've got it now. So Milan was actually the long serving CEO of Straits, which is now Eris. Which is now Eris. So he was uh, until 2012. So he actually was the CEO of the project back when Straits had it. Um, and then... I don't think the Straits share price did too well over that time from memory. No. No, yeah. I'm not I'm not, I'm not. not sure. Not sure. You can see what the, the money they put in it, what they sold and what they had to pay back the debt. Don't they? It didn't look like it performed. Um, they Then he then become... Milan then become the non-executive director of... A non-exec director of Metals X when Metals X owned it. But then in September 2019, Metals X, uh, one of their major shareholders, APAC Resources, put in a 249D notice to remove two of the Metals, uh, Metals X directors due to mm. destruction of shareholder value. <laughs> and one of these directors was Milan Yurkovich. So he stepped down from the board imme- immediately. So he's got a he's got a bit of a history with, uh, with Nifty and now coming back on as the 
chief operating officer. So wow, Maddie, I want to get a bit of uh, a bit of your take on there was a sinkhole at the at the mine. The, yeah, the God, operation that was, on, that was on the news and everything for new for numerous reasons. And then you it's know, a bit under ten years ago now, right? Yeah, so we talk about like the surface subsidence and stuff at um at Capricorn Copper talking about the water going like that's because it's a sub level cave. But this is a this isn't a sinkhole because there's a sub level cave. It actually resulted from uh, underground stope or stopes self mining all the way up into the edge of the pit. And I'll show you the picture here. So it's like pretty much the it self mined itself all the way to the surface right and it come out right at the edge of the pit next to the hall road. So um, wow. yeah, very wow. like, very lucky that that didn't come out in the hall road while the bloody Ute was driving. Well you're lucky the, no, no one was hurt, right? Yeah, exactly. So look then there was a there was an ABC article out and it's where the the workers you've got the workers quotes and then the company quotes from Aditya Birla, um, the workers claimed that the sinkhole was like like due to a lack of backfill because from to my knowledge from the outset at Nifty, the, the pace plant there extremely underperformed and they, they couldn't even come close to like filling the stopes as quickly as quick as they were mining it. And when that happens and you've got a, a lot of uh, open voids and mining out of sequence, this is the result. This is what can happen. Um, so according to that ABC article, like the workers were actually stood down for two months without pay indefinitely. And so you had a ditch of Burla claiming that the company cannot reasonably ha- be held responsible for the current stoppage. And then you've got – but then you had the mine foreman who ABC interviewed saying the team in charge of backfilling the stopes – could not keep up with the amount of ore being taken out and to make up in for the fall in the quality of ore being extracted, the company also ramped up production. Ramping up production means you're opening up more voids that you cannot fill. So, And the workers were actually pooling funds together to start start a class action against Aditya Birla and the company was uh, subject to a industrial relations dispute due to the due to them putting the workers on indefinite mm-hmm. unpaid leave. So I think they eventually paid them redundancies. So look now <laughs> the we'll go through the mine plan. So now they've got to mine that open pit in and around that sinkhole, which is not an uncommon thing. Casey Jam do it all the time, like with old workings, but that sinkhole is is the legacy of that version of of nifty so and so if we talk about a ditcher burl they had the nifty copper mine bit of trivia for you boys do you know what copper mine they sold in 2015 to lighthouse minerals and dmr in what year 2015 they sold a copper mine oh, do you know what it is to Just lighthouse up, and either, dmr yeah. oh, either capricorn um, or, or, or golden yeah. grove golden grove no nah. Mount, Mount Gordon, which is now called Capricorn, Capricorn Copper. So they were they were the owners of Capricorn Copper previously and it went on care and maintenance in 2013. Yeah. Mothballed, they say. So that's how yeah, wow. uh, that that went in AMR and then that's now 29 medals. So, oh, geez, they got a bigger problem than bloody oh, that makes sense. Paste, yeah. paste on being backfilled there now. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you don't need paste there, but there's um, obviously <laughs> I probably wish they did have it now. So I guess the you look at the the nifty the nifty restart and you look what's happened there historically from being a predominantly underground mine now this is proposed to be a big open pit and it's, and I guess the it's the the red flags when you look at the re, the restart study from 2022 it doesn't have any any bloody pictures of what the pit is going to look like, what the ore body looks like, where it is. It just like you think it'd be good to know where the high grade sulfide ore starts, like even though that's not that's not included in that study, that study's just for the oxide ore to restart the leaching. Um, so yeah, you just want it, you want a bit of context on what this mine is going to look like. So I had to go back to like 2021 and 2022 and then back to the old Metals X um, presentations and studies to see what it looks like. So you can see here, You've got – that's the existing open pit. You've got the underground under that and then that green is the big sulphide resource. So they claim, um, oh, I think it's 500 odd, 579,000 tonnes of copper, contained copper within that sulphide resource. But you can see that's in and around that existing underground. So that – there because as I said, their study is just for a – it's from a six and a half year – 6.3 year mine life, but potential to go to 15 plus years. So, and we'll, we'll get into that. So that's, that's what she looks like. Very, very interesting. And you see this cross section I've got here, that big 
curved ore body. It's down. That sulphide and everything looks down bloody deep if they mm. want to go and go and access that. So I guess what the pit is going to look like, this is what I found from Cyprium back in 2020, I think, and you look at the Metals X picture here, um, It's going to they're pretty much going to take out a big chunk of those leach pads eventually if they do go and... Um, do this sulphide expansion project. So, Matty, I haven't read the study, but I remember being under the impression that the restart revolved around yeah heat leach. Heat leach. Like, it, would, can you can you still do that in WA? Just like yeah, restart yeah, heat absolutely. Leach? Yeah, so, like that's what Saturn are planning to do. I think there's. I don't know if there's existing. I'm not sure if there's an existing heat leach operation in WA. But um, yeah. yeah, so they're pretty much going to there. So part of their resource is the old heap leach pads that have already been leached that they still contain copper and they're going to pretty much re, re-leach them, right. move them and re-leach them. So that's part of the actual restart. And as I said, like, it looks like the majority of that sulphide resource is a big chunk of it is in and around the existing underground. So um, now they quote 596,000 tonne at 1.8% copper. Um but I guess the question I have is, is that – are they going to have to mine the open pit into the old underground to get it all out? Because they, they, the whole – a lot of the thesis for it is saying that they just want to do it open pit because it's a lower unit cost. And I couldn't find anything in the Cyprium thing to say, are they – even though they're, they're quoting that there's potential to go to 15 years, but how are they – what will that entail? And I actually oh. went back to the Metals X scoping study in 2020 and it actually states here, in areas where open pit mining will excavate into the existing underground mind, mm. yada, yada, yada. So if they do go down that road to have this potential 15-year mine life to get the high-grade sulphide ore, it'll be pretty bloody interesting trying to navigate yourself around a shitload, a whole underground mine underneath you. Gotcha. Yeah. Just because of the, just the ground the void, support the vo- issues. No, the voids. Like you just, you could, that's the thing, yeah. when you're working around voids in an open pit, you blow blow something up after the blast, next minute there's a, a big hole there or there might be a skin left and then the hole gives way while people are working. So there's there's massive like void management, open hole policy, uh, procedures, void management procedures, Break, like testing breakthroughs, everything. It's a big, yeah. big thing to, uh, yeah. So Casey Jam do it because there's a lot of old, old workings, workings from the golden mile days. Yeah, this would be not sure where into the underground, but that'll be a uh, be very interesting. But it's not you know, like you look at the metrics of this project. It's a head grade for this for the leaching. Uh, what is it? Solvent extraction, electro winning part of it with the oxide ore. Head grade is zero point six five percent copper. And the twenty twenty two study had C three costs of US two eighty two a pound with pre production capex of one hundred and fifty mil. And but that's it. That was at a copper price of four dollars eight per pound. So mm. look, we can assume the C three costs since then would have gone up. And the copper price today is sitting at three dollars seventy eight. So you mentioned what, the what, cost curve, JD. What, what yeah. level study was that? Was it? Was it? Uh, that was a good. Re, that was a, a restart study. Restart. So <laughs> okay. it's, it's a scoping. <laughs> that's a scoping study. Yeah. So yeah, uh, yet another project waiting on a much improved copper price because yes, at that. <laughs> At those margins, with everything up and down, uh, you can't see that getting there, and the and the capex as well. So, because they were they were trying to get like a it was like a two hundred forty million dollar facility to facilitate. They've gone through that many attempts to get funding financing over the last couple of years, and it's just yeah. And I should yeah. round out on on that um, financing the twenty four placement and five million. They actually had oversubscribed, so. Yeah. They took in 7.6 as opposed to just the five. Yeah, so it looks like – but it looks like to restart it based on what they were trying to get, it could be like, you know, two or 300 million bucks to try and get it back happening again. So even after this, once they get trading again, uh, they're looking for a big finance deal to get it happening. Mm. Love it, Matty. Well done. There we go. Nothing compared to you two boys. Well done on the Met, on the bloody Met car. Love it. <laughs> Diversifying. Yeah, it, Trav, there yeah. is an element you like. We're just going to reach those – Coal barons yeah. on Twitter. It's hashtag coal Twitter. Yeah, I like the I like the the thought. I like the thesis of the coal Twitter uh, herd. Um, uh, like I, I I think there's a lot of merit to to it myself. Um, and I'm keen to talk more about it. And keen to have people who are pretty you know experienced in that space 
from an analytical perspective, join us to talk about it. Mate, if you're a guru or you know of a bloody cold guru, give us a fucking ring. We'd love to have you on. <laughs> Right. And a couple of partners to thank oh, for a round out. Oh, how could you how could you forget the partners, JD? You couldn't, mate. See Cheers. those lights? See those lights up above us? The fucking partners are paying for them at the moment. <laughs> the lights wouldn't be on without the partners. Smack Power and Technology, K Drill, Terra Capital, JP Search, and Anytime Expiration Services. We bloody love you. Juice who's. Hooteroo. Hooteroo, money miners. The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation and needs.